Hi all. Welcome to another episode of RPA podcast show and today I have with me Doug Doug Shannon. Doug is very seasoned professional and his impressive experience into AI automation field with over 20 plus years of experience. So Doug in his free time is also advisor for Gartner peer community. He uh, is a member of Automation Congress group. So uh, looking forward to have fun conversation with some insights. Doug, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, I mean, happy happy to be here, Defender. Thanks for the the invite and, and the, the casual conversation and, and what we're going to be talking about here. So I think it's great. Awesome. Would you, would you like to introduce yourself briefly, the kind of exposure that you have into AI space and automation space? Yeah, I think on, on that, like I have a good number of years experience and the, the main thing to understand is, is the perspective that I bring, right? So when, when you hear online and you hear in the news, you know, a lot of the news you're hearing about is from AI researchers and those that are, you know, at the large companies. I myself am an enterprise practitioner, like in the trenches, doing the work, doing the automation, the intelligent automation, driving the teams and doing Gen AI and working with the different platformers to understand how it works, what it does and how to bring it into systems and or enterprises. And so the difference in perspective is different, yet it's at least valuable in regards to knowing how to do things or how to bring things in. And that's what I try to do is I try to get back to the community. That's cool. So could you please share your journey into the field of AI and automation? Like how, uh, what inspired you to get into this field and how you, how you started basically? Yeah, I mean, definitely after 20 plus years of, of IT and information technology and then being told, hey, go do this RPA thing. And it didn't make any sense to me at the time too. Like it doesn't make sense or at least eight, you know, eight years ago or so. It didn't make sense to anybody because they were saying, hey, we already, we already do automation. But seeing that it had auto controls and all that and it was, you know, a way to bring that digital transformation, a way to bring things from analog to digital to really handle a lot of the legacy stuff, especially when APIs weren't always available. And even then with APIs now being more available, they're still not always perfect and they always aren't free and they always don't do what they're supposed to do. So there's still a lot of you know leverage and that's why you know RPA in a sense may be going away a little bit, but intelligent automation is going to always be part of the enterprise toolkit. And that's something to look forward to. So where I came in, is I came in with the IT experience. The the other perspective that I that I provide is that a lot of individuals in this space were, especially leaders, were brought in as like analysts and business analysts that were leading teams or leading projects or project teams. So my perspective, although I was leading a QA team at the time, like a quality assurance team, when I when I moved into the RPA automation space, the difference is I, I still bring a very technical background. And so one of my claim to fame was that I brought, you know, very early on you know, self-healing automations and how to understand that and how to navigate that. So even now with many of the companies I've worked with, my maintenance work that the team does that I work with in general and drive is like one, maybe two people, you know, handling millions of dollars of ROI and not really having them any maintenance issues. So having that ability to not eat into the ROI is, is, is massively important. So that's the perspective that I bring. Okay. Okay. I have noticed you have spoken about the transition from AI to Gen AI. Like, could you please explain uh, what Gen AI, Gen AI is to the audience and how it traditionally differs uh, the AI? Yeah, so traditional AI, classic ML, machine learning, NLP, natural language processing, it, it very much was already kind of grounded, right? So we're going to hear terms like that and we've already been hearing terms like that. So it had information that was being pulled from and on RPA and even automation fed into that a little bit. So it would, in the traditional sense of AI, of artificial intelligence, we would feed the information to those teams into their sandboxes and into their ML libraries. They would be able to take that information and run with it because it was always constant, not, you know, but always like static, right? So it was always able to get the right information when they needed to. So it never drifted much on the AI side. But when, you know, still there was always issues there on, it wasn't always the, the automation, the automations helped, but then you had the end users and or people and employees that would change the data. And then of course the models would change and you had to build a new ML model, all kinds of things on the AI side would always cause, you know, failures or potential issues or gaps. However, Gen AI comes in and brings in basically suggestion models and nuanced understanding and very high fidelity of, of foundational models that we're seeing that are starting to turn into world models. And, and it's massive changing because it's the ease of use side of it. So having the users, having the employees and the people to be enabled to ask questions and get some semblance of understanding or some semblance of a great suggestion so that that blank page approach of, okay, I'm asked to do this thing, but where do I start? Just ask the question and you can usually get a, a good start. But again, like we have to retrain ourselves and, and don't 
always believe it. Don't always take its word for granted. Like it's it's not always correct because not only the hallucinations that you hear about, I always tend to talk about the hypnotization because we can hypnotize it ourselves. We can tell it the wrong thing mm-hmm. or put in the wrong prompt or the wrong understanding or even the wrong grounding or the wrong expectations and you get the wrong answer. So it may not look like the wrong answer though, but it's definitely the wrong answer. So that's the, big, the biggest issues or things to understand is that traditional AI still has a place. It, it is very valid if done right. And, and a lot of times it could be, but a lot of the issues with traditional AI were actually not with the technology, it was with the user and the user engagement and how they didn't know or they weren't expected or weren't explained how to use it or vice versa. And then the Gen AI side, it's where's the use cases? How do we drive this thing? How do we involve it now? Which I can answer some of that. And and where is it going, right? And so I think the where it's going is going to be a lot better conversation because we live in very interesting times and everything's changing very fast. But the right now is it's a really good suggestion engine. Okay, so uh, like how you see, for example, a lot of automation companies or uh, I would say the companies that are implementing RPA solutions, right? How they view this, uh, uh, like how they can incorporate everywhere people are trying to build something or pilot something on J and RPA and get advantage of the uh, Gen AI, right? So how do you see in future how, how this will uh, take, take a shape? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so the the environment right now is still very new. Most enterprises that went into this early are starting to realize there is an insane cost. Uh, it's insane because it's also unknown, and that, that makes it very hard to quantify. So when you do find a use case, which still most people are looking at, knowledge bases, how to pull down contextual rags or how to talk to your semantic semantic data, you know, understanding like how am I talking to it? What am I like advanced advanced name searches? That's the use cases, right? And and that's not always the best because how do you quantify is there value there? And it's really hard. But you can definitely quantify how much it's costing you per day, month, yet you can't plan ahead of time because you only find out after the fact. Again, it's like it's like project management backwards. You know, you used to say, I have this much budget, I'm going to go do this thing, or we're going to go build this thing, or we're going to bring in this vendor, we're going to do this, this great thing that's going to bring in this much X back. We don't have that with Gen AI. When you work with the big platforms, you find that there's not only hidden costs, so to say, but there's also other features and other token grabs, or just the fact that if you have all of your users and your employees utilizing this technology, it's very token heavy because it, it responds with a lot of text. You can ask it one sentence, it's going to give you 50 back. And that's going to cost you around two to four dollars or three euros or, or what have you. And so there's that cost, the token cost. And then there's the cost of the daily use of it. There's service charges. There's charges to like open AI of like monthly charges. So like, is it worth it? And, and that is still a very big question that most are having. And, and most are saying, well, do we? continue on, which ideally you want to learn and grow because you want to be the first to market. You want to be the first to actually enable this technology because every enterprise out there is looking at NVIDIA saying, wow, like those guys, they used it and they're way up here. That's a 10x, 100x, 1000 like it's insane. So, But they had the money, they put it in, they built their own models. They're using it to drive their, their actual frameworks around hardware, which Again, it's amazing that it takes a lot of really smart people and not every enterprise is going to have those individuals that are that are driving this, that understand that because they don't have not only the millions of dollars to actually drive this and put it in, they don't have the millions of dollars to pay the people to actually do it. And so how do you how do you do it and where does it go? Right. So then the question was, where is it going? In regards to where it's going, it's it's going to be, you know, foundational models that we have now. And the current companies that are in play, the main platforms, Llama, everybody, uh, GPT, you, know, you name it, Amazon, even with Bedrock. So they're building models that are becoming world models that are going to compute around us, humans. We don't, they don't need us per se. And that's where when you have conversations and you see people out there like Elon Musk talking about how jobs are going to be taken over and, and this is the way it looks because the current market, the current outlook that is out there that's being controlled by particular players, they're not putting humans in the loop. They're not building collaborative mechanisms and enterprises that are large and, and, you know, ongoing for many of years, they, they're not going to change and go, well, what do we do with our people? Like, sure, they can, they can get rid of people ideally, but you don't really want to because then, then you're alienating the rest of the people that are there. So it's a, there is a, a lot of social and professional conversations that need to happen and are going to be happening one way or another. And that's an interesting future, but we can dive into more of the technical if we need to, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So uh, you have mentioned the concept of autonomous enterprise. Could you please explain what you mean by autonomous enterprise to the audience? Yeah, I mean, definitely the autonomous enterprise is 
it could be lengthy, right? But then I think that the, the quickest way to understand it is it's not all autonomous. And, and the way that I try to bring this as a practitioner, as someone that's built in automation and looked at how humans need to be in the loop and how they get involved and collaborate, I look at that. And so the Thomas Enterprise to me is how are we collaborating with the Gen AI and AI concepts or AI functions? And how are we building multiple agents or multi-agent frameworks around that? Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you envision AI transforming businesses into autonomous entities? So the hardest part about enterprises and or large businesses in general is is driving the data. So where does the data live? Where does it rest? Where where does it go when the users touch it? What kind of R back, like the rules, uh, rules access, you know, controls are in place? What are those users' roles? What are those users' positions in the company? Because once you have, once you define those things, then you can actually control where the things are going. And, and then some of the biggest issues that are in Gen AI right now, when you want to bring it in, you're asked, how do you filter your data? So what do you filter it as? Like IT, this and then. How do you categorize your data? What does it mean? So you can get your structured data very quickly, but your unstructured is very sparse. Like it, no one has any way to really explain the unstructured side. It's kind of like, and there's a structure, then there's all the rest. So the idea of the autonomous enterprise and how that drives forward through enterprises is to find the data, not like just in data lakes, not like in classical like lighthouses and lake houses and stuff like that. You know, you can actually utilize multiple agents or right now we're going to be seeing agentic frameworks, but I think we're going to get past that very quickly and go to multi-agents. And those multi-agents will be able to we will be able to handle the data at length and at speed and work together. Yeah, I mean you coined uh, like you already mentioned that term agentic process automation AP that is going rounds over over LinkedIn. I mean uh, in the past couple of weeks, and people are comparing RPA and APA. So would you like to uh, uh, put some thoughts there? How you, how you feel like what is agentic process automation and how it would benefit? Like it's really a thing there or just just yeah. a concept i mean I, I can definitely provide my thoughts it's conceptual now it is very quickly moving into reality the, you know my personal beliefs or my personal understanding of apa agentic process automation is that and this is where you know those of us listening to this and, and those of us in the audience that are automation experts or, or in automation or been doing automation we're in a very good spot because we understand processes. We understand how users work with processes. We know how to work with those same people to bring them in, to engage with them, and build not just digital transformation, but build like a movement around, let's get these things automated. Because once we automate it, we get the ROI, we're saving them time, we're, we're, we're taking that, that bot out of the human, right? And so we understand that side. But again, like the people that are talking around agentic process automation or agentic workflows in general are AI researchers. So AI people don't always get processes, right? They're very much, here's the data, where does it live? Where is it moving? Here's, here's how we're defining it. There's a sandbox that is, here's how we name it, define it, and look at it. And, and then we have, boom, AI. But how do you do that around process automation? Well, you have to build it out just like we've already done it. And so this is where I, I tell everybody in the, in the automation space, start learning Gen AI, start getting into it because we have we have the upper hand, at least in this way, because mm -hmm. we've already done it. We know what it looks like and we know how to bring that kind of stuff in because I don't think Agentic is going to last. I think Agentic is, is, is a great way to look at it. It's a great way to start saying, hey, Gen AI, how do we get these two things to marry and get together because the enterprise needs this and it's the only way that's going to make sense for the enterprise is to have some kind of way to drive processes. So let's let's do that, right? So, but after mm -hmm. Agentic, I do believe 100% that we're moving to smaller form factors, multiple agents, and to multi-agent frameworks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your thoughts, Doug. I see everybody, like now it's quite evident that only RPA will not take you places. Okay. You have to combine the AI tech stack. Okay. AI ML tech stack. So everybody that advises to the developers who are into RPA and automation space to get upskilled themselves into AI, like AI terminologies and AI technologies to the core. But nobody talks about the transition, how to get there, because most of the RPA developers, and I keep on getting these queries, most of the RPA developers have started their career directly from the low code and no code platforms. Yeah, most of them don't have even the development background. So yep. it's really challenging for them to pave a path and get upskilled into AI because AI and AML is a very broad term and what specific they need to focus on. Could you, could you please share your uh, share uh, your knowledge area or like your path, what you would advise them? Yeah, I mean, what, what I would do is what I've, what I've done. Right? So last year, early on, like October of last year, it was like, how do we do this? How do we bring this in? How do we drive Gen AI into automation? And really, you're taking that 
same low code technology used in like UiPath, Automation Network, Boot Prism. And you're saying, here's the process. I'm going to take the human out of the loop and I'm going to put Gen AI in the loop. But how do you do that, right? So we are, you know, what I was always suggesting that the teams do is that they, they go in and they say, okay, you know, we start the process, there's a trigger for it, right? Well, maybe that trigger is actually something that we actually have the automation go and ask Gen AI, what do we need to know about this thing? Or it provides some context. Just like if we had a human, we say, hey, this starts off here, but we need a human to say, what is that? And so maybe we have Gen AI say, what is that? And the prompt coming through automation is a very static prompt. It's not going to change. So your hallucination is going to be very low. It's not going to model drift very much because you're asking the same prompt. And you get this, this generalized beginning. And then sometimes with automation, you have a middle part where you do this front 20, 40%. And you're like, man, we got to get to that other part, but I need to know this, or I need to know what am I seeing, or what am I doing, or what is the information in this other database, or how can I concatenate or pull this information? Great. And use Gen AI. Again, prompt it, get the response, bring that back into the automation. And this whole process is what I call as AI spanning. And so AI spanning is how I would say is the quickest way to look at it and to really drive that forward. Although to, to your question, right, you were saying, while you were talking about that question, I was thinking, really, if... Another way to look at it is if they learned how GPTs work from OpenAI, it's kind of the same thing, right? So you, you're you building a process around something, you're building knowledge around something, and you're asking it to do something that's it's a process, right? So that same logic could be built into automation, and automation could be built into that. So think of them as interchangeable. Think of them as a, as a way to audit your Gen AI. And so if you take that audit log and you use automation to bridge that gap, you're going to have very understood Gen AI, you're going to have very audited Gen AI, and you're going to have better prompting and better understanding of how it works within your own enterprise or your own business. So if we, if we break it down to the low level from a developer aspect, so it would be like consuming few REST APIs and, and know the, uh, the technology, how, how it works behind the scene. For example, ChatGPT, for instance. Yeah, because you, you can use REST and pull in APIs and, and do calls to OpenAI, right? So you can yeah. do the same thing, pull mm -hmm. it in and, and gain that contextual understanding, just like if you would if a human was, was being asked a question. And they can get started with the basics of how, how, what are the AI concepts, AI ML concepts, and they, they should know the basic things like prompt engineering, tokenization. So all those terminologies they should get acquainted with and get started with one of their process uh, implementing these features in one of the processes. So that is the number one stage yeah. one path. Yeah. Yeah. Even even current processes, right? So if you you know all of us have processes that are out there, all of them should be relooked at at certain times anyway. And so maybe you go back and you look at those and go, hey man, what's that one that we have where, you know, we're always asking the same question, but what if we can answer that question with Gen AI? Does it help it? And if it does, great. Or if it doesn't, maybe maybe build something on the side to say, what does it look like? You know, could it be used same same way we do with the end users, right? Sometimes we build something small to understand how it works in that person's environment, that organization, or with those teams. And then we show them and they go, wow, that's great. And then they go, we want more of that. And so great, do it to yourself. Like run your own pilots and say, what if we built this thing, build something small, simple, ask a question, get an answer, bam, you know, do so safely. Don't just use the website of OpenAI, like actually go through like Azure or some of the platforms and do it the right way. And then, and then test it out. And then does it work? Great. There, there's a win there. Yeah. So kind of POCs. Cool. So what do you believe are the biggest challenges uh, we are facing in uh, AI development and implementation today? So many. <laughs> so the uh, where would we go with this? Um, there's, there's bias issues, ethical issues. Uh, some of those can be defined down to the human level because we are biased creatures by nature. I think the scientific study there was like we carry 50 different biases at all times. People are going to watch this and say, these guys are wearing T-shirts, but we're like trying to have a casual conversation. They're going to go, oh, we're not going to listen to those guys. They have T-shirts on. There, there's all those options, right? And so that's a bias, right? Like you're going to say like, oh, darn, you know, don't don't do that. But I, I think at the end of the day, like we're, we're going to have to look at, there's a difference between social bias and then there's professional bias. And, and between that, when we're in a professional environment and we're working with data, even when our own enterprises, our own businesses, we need to understand that because even in prompting, Prompting is important, but maybe prompting isn't as important as understanding the bias in our in our data and the bias in how we input our data. Because data is biased because we put it there. Like that, that's why. Like it's our fault. So <laughs> we need to understand that and actually acknowledge it because that's the only way to move forward. So I think that's one of the bigger ones that nobody really talks about, and, and it's something that is really conceptually hard to explain and conceptually hard for C suites and businesses to get behind and go. Well, it's not our fault. It's like, yeah, it kind of is. Like, it, but it's okay. It is okay to be at fault. And that is, that is one of the things I talk to. Whereas I believe the only constant really is, is people failing, you know, because when we fail, we learn. And that's how humans just learn in general. So I think we need to fail a bunch and try, and we're going to get a lot better for it.
Yeah, so the current phase of the organization is like that. They've they have done the, they are, they already passed the first phase where they have done the POCs or they have they've gotten the test taste of AI uh, Gen AI capabilities. I think I would say that. And then now they are figuring out on on the ethical ways, on the responsible ways of incorporating the technology into the solutions. Yeah, figuring out for like those yeah. cases, right? Yeah, yeah. they figured out how it works for for yeah. them, how yeah. it works yeah. for each individual enterprise and organization, and then and they find out how much it costs, and they go, "Wait, what?" <laughs> yeah, that is a <laughs> that's a big factor to be considered. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there will be one. Uh, like, I would like to f add a follow up question on uh, your thought from your, from uh, the previous conversation that we had. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on the ethical considerations companies should keep in mind while while deploying their solutions or building their solutions using AI? Yeah, I think. Other than like the bias stuff and other than professional bias and understanding the data and where it comes from and that we're humans, I believe that the the biggest ethical items are we need to understand that people in the enterprises, people in the companies, they're going to use Gen AI if we want them to or not. And so the best thing to do right now is find ways to enable that. There are some some cheaper solutions. Microsoft's even discounting some of their stuff to make it ease, more ease of use to get into these enterprises, uh, probably purposely. But then, so it's, it's a matter of like enable the use of it so that we can start to teach about it. Because if if we if we pull back and say let's let's train everybody on Gen AI, if they're not using it, it's a classic do one see like see one do one learn one teach one. Uh, basically, as most people say most people say see one do one learn one or what have you. I say see one do one learn one, teach one, because then you actually understand it. Because when, I, I believe mm -hmm. that in mm -hmm. general, people don't actually, they're not experts until like, what is it, like 10,000 hours. But in general, I think that on the path of becoming an expert, on the path of understanding what you're actually looking at, if you teach about it, if you teach someone else, even if it's like a friend or a family member or somebody, you're like, hey, I learned this thing. But you then gain that person's perspective and go, that's a different way to look at it. And then you start to go, okay, there's a better conversation here. So I think in business, they need to do a lot of that. We need people inside of these companies. We need champions to say, I want to go try a thing. And then I want to teach the people to do the thing because then I'm going to get better perspective and I'm going to be better for it. And then mm -hmm. as if they're better for it or you're better for it or I'm better for it, then the company's going to be better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your insights on this. Now, a little bit moving on to your personal side, uh, Doug. So how how a day in your life, like, I mean, your entire day, I mean, from start to end, uh, how it, how does it look like? What are the activities that you do? Yeah, uh, so I always try to pre-plan where I can any of the LinkedIn stuff that I do. That's usually done at night, the day before or a couple of days before. Yeah, oh, that's about right. And then, because I do a lot of LinkedIn, so Monday through Friday, I post on LinkedIn probably at least like once a day unless there's something crazy going on. And then weekends I take off because I because I spend time with my family and, and try to relax and, and check out a little bit from the, the fire hose of information that, that comes out. Uh, but I do a lot of research and but my day my day today is always like day job is priority. Uh, I don't talk about that because it's a it can be found on my LinkedIn and everything. But they're a private company and so they do what they do and I and I run what I do for them there. And then uh, lunchtime is lunchtime and then more more work and then get done with work and then usually it's like go pick up kids and do the things that you know the daily life that people need to do like grab groceries and do all those things and then it's like okay do some research when i have some downtime see what's going on in the news uh, maybe on lunchtime to see like what's happening listen to a podcast or two uh just to try to you know get a good grasp of like what's happening am i missing anything is there is there a future that i'm not seeing and in, in general trying to help the the day job trying to help the community trying to help everyone else to understand because i try to i take the same approach about how can i teach so when i do research i'm actually trying to also uh, i put that out on linkedin because the research i did is, is valuable i think and then i try to provide my professor perspective on that which then is a way of teaching and so then i get that feedback which is great to hear from the community even people are saying no it's a horrible perspective uh it's still great to hear uh, although i don't get that that much thank goodness but in general it's good to do that and then work with the different uh, council groups that I work with. So think tanks, councils, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the ones that you mentioned in the beginning, those help a lot because it, it's, it's speaking to other experts and, and experts from different areas and not the same, you know, echo chamber that can, that can happen at times. So I'm very aware of trying to avoid any kind of echo chamber information. Although echo chambers do help speed people up into general areas, but you have to be careful not to just stay in that area. Okay, cool. That's awesome. And uh, like when you're not working, apart from your work, I mean, what do you do in general? 
Yeah, uh, mainly hang out with my kids. So hang out with my kids. <laughs> try, try to get out of the office um, or out of you know just in the daylight and do more things. Play, play, ride bikes. You know, go visit different areas. Uh, California is 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 very pretty, and there's a lot to do. You can two hours. It's like snow. Two hours. It's like beach. And then depending on what beach you want, and six hours you got Disneyland. So it's uh, in the bay. The Bay Area is is a whole lot of stuff. And then even outside of that, there's there's a, a huge AI community. And I try to go to many of those those efforts and talk to those people, even all the startups, to understand, you know, what are they trying to go to market with? What are they trying to take on? And then having those conversations with them, saying, you know, just because you have an API call into the back door of some platform doesn't mean you're enterprise. Uh, you have to be careful with that. So it's good to have those kind of conversations to drive to drive, again to, to help the community out and, and kind of really see where it's going. Awesome. So uh, and we we can call you as a family man. <laughs> I try to, try to teach the kids coding and, and keep them very creative. I, I do believe that the the future of where humans are going, whether or not there's job losses, whether or not there's there's changes, the innovations, and how that all works out, the more creative we can maintain in our own creativity and being creative as, as humans, uh, the better we're going to be off in the long run. And, and the social skills, right? So, you know, teaching the kids and teaching ourselves how to engage with people better, you know, something I try to do every time I get, you know, more followers, every thousand, I, I try to get back to the community and, say, and I showcase people in the community and say, hey, this was number, you know, whatever thousand, here's their background. Here, like, they're human too. Like, we all are. So, like, this is very collaborative. We are, we're all the same at the end of the day. And that's, that's what we need to be looking at, really, especially at the as things kind of tailor into this new this new world of Gen AI and AI and where that's all going with the innovations around it. Uh, would you mind sharing your age of your kids and what what technology you're you're trying to teach them in terms of programming? Yeah, so they're preteens, but in okay. general, the the things I try to teach them is is not strictly programming. Like we'll dive into some Scratch and stuff like that, basic stuff like inputs, outputs, and things like that. But really, I try to get them to understand the concepts, the the overall concepts, like what is programming language? How does it relate? You know, what mm -hmm. are do-while loops? Like the, the basics of like what, how do things work? And then we can dive into, you know, looking at things and, and teachable moments. Like, do you see why the Roomba is not working? Or do you notice that like it doesn't work in this area for whatever reason? Why is that? And so teachable moments are, are a big thing. But again, like talking about Gen AI, I mean, it learns by nuance. The, really the same way that kids learn and we all learn by nuance you know i don't know how many times i was younger and i was like i'm gonna do this thing and i got smacked on the on the wherever and so like don't do that i'm like oh nuance right i'm not gonna do that again so i mean gen ai is the same way in, in many cases not exactly the same but in many cases it does learn in, in a sense because it is trying to to make us happy you know, trying to you know get that get that token yeah yeah, yeah. super super anal analogy so with that, we'll uh, I'll, I'll jump on to the next question that I have in my mind is so currently there are two set of uh, the organizations that are at, at the two levels. First, they are already building automation solutions, whether it's RPA or any any technology. I mean, combined together as an automation or as a process automation. So that is one one piece of the audience, and there are, there are others who are who are just planning to get started for their digital transformation journey. They have zero footprints, let's say. So what would be your advice to both of these, how they can, how they can get started for the later one and the, the one who are already building solutions, how they can get to hyper automation, uh, the next stage of automation, that's what we call. So there are two, two yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so those, those getting started, you know, if you're, if you're not doing RPA, intelligence automation, if you're not understanding where your processes are, start doing like business process mapping, right? Start to understand where your processes live, who's running them, because you're already going to have, you know, attrition anyway, because people move jobs roughly every two to three years. And you need to start understanding what those processes are. If you don't, the tribal knowledge of people moving and grooving and doing their own thing and moving jobs is going to be lost in the mix. And that's, you know, RPA is not going to solve that part portion. Um, intelligence automation will have a little bit of help there because you can do process finding and task finding, which will give you process discovery. Although even those things may be changing. So it really just starts with basic business process mapping understand that and then you start to get into well, what's the, the quick and easy rpa stuff with robotic process automation stuff and then you move into hey we learned this very well and i think one thing to always remember with intelligent automation is it's not intelligent until your team that's doing the work your coe your center of excellence your center of enablement 
that's doing the work is also intelligent. Uh, and that's not saying that they're dumb. I'm just saying like they have to learn the processes. And they have to learn how that works inside the organization and that enterprise. And that takes a little bit of time. But, but as they learn, they're going to build more utility. They're going to build more reusable parts. They're going to build more understanding of, well, this is how these updates work at this company. This is how the IT works. This is how the system, this person, that, that organization inside this organization works. So that always gets better. So start there. Then now for the second question, right, is, is if you're already started, you know, are you doing the same things I just mentioned already? You know, do you have a center of excellence? You're going to probably want one. And in, in the past, people have said, we don't need center of excellence. We're just going to outsource this or whatnot. But those that actually insourced it are finding more value. And they're finding more value because, again, those that team has learned the company, has learned the people in the company, and has been able to drive innovation inside that when they do bring on things like Gen AI, because they were to have process mitigation, they were to have ROI already been driven, they have some of that ROI can be used to buy new things and drive new things and drive those efforts. So when you have a COE, that team, that's that, the center of excellence team is, is driving, can actually bring in Gen AI as well and mix the two together and, and do some of the AI spanning where you're you're building in Gen AI with your automation and vice versa, or just bring it in and help to understand the technology side or the data security side or the information security side and really bring that forward. Because at the end of the day, your, your automation teams, especially if they're internal, which I would always advise that because they're going to be more security savvy. They're going to be already knowing how these processes move and what they touch. So when you say, we're going to do Gen AI, it's going to touch this data set and that data set and this vendor and this website and this thing, who are you going to trust? The random AI person that just got hired on that doesn't know the company, or are you going to trust the COE that's like, oh, hey, we've done that. We can also still use it automation here, here, and here to save tokens because you have to remember like automation is after like three years, it's pretty much free because you should have enough ROI that, you know, the value offset, like your licenses are paid for, your VMs are paid for, your you know, Microsoft services and your E3 or E5 licenses for at least the efforts that you're doing are paid for uh, because of the ROI. And so you have that ability to soak some of that. And so there's there's value there. And so I think if you look at it from that perspective, there's going to be massive value gain. And then just, you know, again, like get the right partners, get the right vendors that you may want to get involved with. I can always recommend some. Uh, but in general, like that that's the mix. That's how I would run down with it. Yeah. Thanks, Doug, for sharing those insights based on your expertise and the experience that you carry. Uh, it will really help uh, the companies who are looking in the respective tracks. Yeah. With that, um, I would like to ask you, like, where do you see the future of automation and AI in the next five years? Yeah, the next five years, like, like I mentioned kind of previously, but the, the whole timeline is, you know, RPA is going to be done more by automation or by, by artificial intelligence or Gen AI because it's able to take the, the, the quick wins. But it's not going to be able to do that until you have agents in play for each user so that it starts to understand and map those mappings to understand what the user wants. Because... Citizen developers, no matter how you slice it, don't really work, and they do for a time. And you can do some really cool things with citizen developers. There's a lot of hand-holding, a lot of support. Mm. But until we have agents that are kind of like watching and working with the user and understanding what that looks like, you're not going to see those big wins. And, and if you do, you'll see in the beginning, and then they taper off because people get busy. People forget about it, and you'll, have, you'll end up having... I've seen companies that had 2,000 citizen developers. Do you know how many were using it after about a year? I think it was like 70. So be mindful that it's not always going to work out and, and to try different things. But again, you need a COE to be aware of these things so that they can actually watch it and, and find ways to mitigate it. And so, but the future is, you know, we're going to see a Gentic come in and that's where both innovation sides, like the Gen AI innovation is trying to understand processes. Totally get that. It makes sense. Uh, it's not going to last more than probably a year or maybe it goes its own way. There's, there's a chance that innovation just says, no, 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 we're doing AI and we're doing Gen AI. We're going to drive that path forward. And it goes one way and then intelligent automation and starts using Gen AI and goes another way. And then we see who wins out. But I do believe that the future of intelligent automation is moving to multi-agent frameworks where there's multiple agents that do different things. There's the agent that lives on the user system. It's going to be driving that information with them and doing that kind of system development kind of handholding. And then you're going to have multiple other agents that are doing different functions or different uh, items. There's a company right now building expert agents that is doing some amazing things with COBOL and moving things around and, and really bringing back like 30 to 300 X like value. So it's, it's huge. So expert agents have the ability to drive many, many features uh, from even old technology to new stuff and have personalities and actually have chain of thought and chain of reasoning. And there's 
It's fantastic. So I think that's going to win out because, again, the same way Gen AI went out, won out in this first half of if we can search with it, we can drive it, it's ease of use, it makes sense. Now, how do we get that in people's hands? And how do we do it safely? And how do we do it so we actually understand what they're doing so that we know it's being done safely and we know it's being done with guardrails, just like RPA and automation did? Yeah, yeah. Super, super. So I think um, I, I can see uh, there's a UiPath robot uh, in your background. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's the story? <laughs> what's the story of these? Yeah, I mean, my, my preferred platform, I, I do use UiPath. It's one of the ones I've used. The reason why is the orchestration, uh, the asset handling and whatnot. I do a lot of reusable parts and stuff like that in there. So uh, I've been to forward uh, four, five, six, and I'll probably be at seven. And I usually, I think I have, yeah, they're on there four, five, and six. And then, uh, so, and then ideally seven, I've, I've spoken at all of them. I'll probably speak at seven too and be talking about multi digit frameworks probably. Okay. Okay. So, cool, cool. so did you, do you, do you have a uh, experience also like you try your hands on different RPA platforms as well, apart from your path? Yeah. I mean, definitely uh, the multiple companies I've, I've actually ran automation platforms through, it's always usually starts with like, which one do we pick? And so do we usually do POCs and different things. Uh, however, I, again, like the orchestration and the way that UiPath has the ability of like, if I buy a bot through them, I can actually use it, even if I wanted to use it outside of an enterprise. It's like you have the ability to do that. Once you own that bot, you can say like, oh, hey, not, not many people know this, but it, it does work and, and they're okay with it, is that you can actually use your bot time to do whatever you want. So I can go build something really amazing inside of a company and then sell that and do automations outside the company if the company's okay with that, and then and then actually make money for the company. So there's lots of lots of ways to think about it and thinking outside the box. And that I feel like that they give me more of that. Okay. So you mean to say like you build your automation and you run it uh, you export it and run it anywhere. That That's what you mean by that? Uh, kind of, but you're going to use the same bot license and the bot time, okay. right? And so okay. ideally, you probably have two different licenses usually because you usually don't want to mix the two anyway, but you can. And mm -hmm. especially if you're building something internally or depending on how your organization does it, sometimes organizations use automation and they, they charge internally. So the very large ones will charge different parts of the organization. And so that's kind of, it's a, it's a win-win for that too. Got it, got it. So finally, what would you advise to the young professionals aspiring to build career into AI and automation space? Learn quick. <laughs> the The hard part is we're moving so fast, and I've actually written about this because I am slightly worried about it, is that we're moving so fast that colleges can't keep up, even businesses can't keep up, the enterprise C-suites can't keep up. So the leaders that are out there, they, they don't know. And, and, and even if they get training, they still don't know because it moves so fast. So how does the graduate that wants to get in this field that probably heard from a friend that there's a lot of money to be made. It's okay. I mean, I, I know project managers that probably make more than most of the people out here. But in general, the there's no ladder system. There's no like you you graduate and then how do you get to here? And it's like it's like the only way is like fail, 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 and get lucky. And, and that's not a, that's not a good solution. That's a, that's a horrible solution. So. I mean, the hope is that we change something because because it does need to change. And I'm I'm starting to look at like how do we build that as a social eco structure or ecosystem around like maybe bringing back like the the idea of like medieval guilds that like these guilds have like bot practitioners, automation practitioners, Gen AI practitioners, and we can help these people learn the trades, and so they get like. The ability to learn it and we can showcase that and companies work with individuals or the nonprofits and stuff or some of those companies that i'm looking to to drive and, and do some of this stuff because we need to help the, those those that are that are coming in because if we don't then what's happening is it just doesn't work like you get you get right out of college and, and then you hope to gosh darn you went to the right college that get that has the right program to get to the right spot and if you did it you're like wait I hope, my friend went to the other college hopefully they get me in it's it's not easy and it's very frustrating and, and I get it. And, and although there is a, a lack of developers out there at the same time, there's, you know, with, with the ability of, I mean, coding now is, is now the English language and you just talk to these code, these, these Gen AI and then they give you code out and it can be in the form of Python or whatever you need. It's not always perfect, but it can get you most of the way there. And that's, that's again, where the reason why I teach, you know, even my kids, I'm like, Hey, understand the concepts, understand the basics. So that you can like suss out the code, but you're going to be able just to talk to it and get there in the future. Like kids, kids are just going to be talking to Gen AI or whatever it's going to be. Maybe it's AGI. I don't think we're going to get there. We had the chance. We didn't hit it. And now the hardware is taking over. We saw the same kind of thing in the, in the history of innovation. It's a whole other conversation. So, so yeah, great. like learn, learn quick. Learn quick. I mean, learn fast. Yeah. That would be your, your mantra. I mean, yeah, learn, learn fast and fail hard, but 
you know, have have some grit. The the challenge that they face is like they they keep on uh, they they take courses, they learn things. When there is a challenge, they get they they cannot find a job because organizations expect some experienced candidates, at least one, two, three years kind of experience. So yeah. that is a challenge uh, with yeah with the graduates. It is, and there's 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 small startups that you can get involved in. There are the the RPA platforms that do kind of like Upwork and Rework, and some of these guys are Rework. Uh, there's another one out there. I forget what it is. And then there's uh, the Tomato for Marketplace is yeah. there. Where yeah. Mm, and then on yeah, one of your shows actually so, Rajesh, so working yeah. with, with, with him right yeah Rajesh, he's, he's great you know driving that through and just and getting that experience because he can start to to build out that and help and help kind of you know tailor that also there was in between there was one we uh there was one startup i mean i'm not sure where where they are rpa app.io where it was like a replica of a fiber but only specific to automation uh developers yeah they're in south america they're they're kind of yeah. like automator but in south america so automator's in uh, australia mm -hmm. and then that one's in uh south america. both of both of them do uh fairly well i think automator has a larger following but in general like that's that's some of the stuff that i would get involved in if i was new just to kind of cut my teeth on it and then also gives you a chance to learn other other platforms because I mean, the future is also like, hey, what platforms do you know? And I know many developers that are in the, the, the higher level developers are starting to look at like, okay, not just automation anywhere, Blue Prism and UiPath. What about, you know, power platforms and whatnot? Because with the co-pilots coming in from Microsoft and having a big play there, there's a lot of nuance you can do and bring in Power Automate. The only issue that's still not really orchestrated. And so it's very you know there's there's workflow automation right and there's a lot of workflow automation out there right now and then there's there's R, you know rpa and automation side intelligence automation side uh, i tend to be more on like believing in the intelligence automation side than the workflow because you know again like that citizen developer approach i think people need someone to go to to be like that center of excellence to really drive like the very meaningful automation but i mean both both work i mean i've, I've seen some amazing things come out of workflow automation so i think at the end of the day it depends on the people it depends on the company it depends on how agile savvy the company is i've worked at companies that are highly agile and it's impressive what can be done and and how quickly and i've worked at companies that are not agile and may not even know how to spell the word agile and it's a little slower but it's okay yeah, even even I keep on getting these queries many a times. Like, what to get started with in terms of the platform? Some some says like, what should I pick? Automation anywhere, UiPath, Power Automate, Blue Prism. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Automation Anywhere right now is doing some really neat stuff with agents, mm. which is which is cool because that's that's new. Uh, Blue Prism is doing some fantastic stuff around predictive analytics and predictive maintenance and predictive like understanding version control very well. And so there's some wins there. UiPath is trying to reinvent itself again and do a lot of AI, although they're, they're with a new change in leadership going back to where it came from. There, that could be a win. I don't know what they're doing yet. You know, luckily their platform is still pretty savvy and pretty spot on. The the win that UiPath has, especially for new people looking at it, is it's just the free the free training. The, the UiPath University is fantastic, and so yeah. mm -hmm. that's that's the easy path, right? And so. I would I would say if that's easy and you can do it, at least it shows the interest. And, and really, as somebody starting into this field, showing interest and showing the passion is is half the battle. Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. So, I mean, uh, I I am loving uh, the conversations that we are having, but we have to be mindful of time. So I think yeah, yeah, I it, it, <laughs> so it's really good to have a uh, like have you on my show, and we we touch based upon a lot of lot of points, and I really enjoyed uh, the the conversation that we had. Hopefully, the audience will get some value out of it. And I would like to thank you, uh, Doug, for sparing time out of your busy schedule. I know you're you're a very busy guy. So thanks. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, like I said, I try to get back. And, you know, th there's all kinds of ways to do it. And then sometimes people don't do things because they, they want money for stuff. Sadly, I don't get money on the side for stuff. I probably shouldn't ask for money. But in general, it's good to give back to the community because, you know, it's a small world, especially the automation world. Even the Gen AI world is, is fairly small. And the more we work together, the more we collaborate, the more we drive that forward, it's going to be fantastic. So in the world of tomorrow, we're all going to meet each other at some point. So we might as well talk about it. And if we're not talking about it, then we're missing something. And, and that part of that we're missing is probably that human, that human aspect of it.
So yeah, no, happy to be here. Happy to add value. And if anybody has questions, uh, the best way to contact me is just to reach out on LinkedIn. I, I wish I was in more spaces. I wish I had more time to do more things. I should probably find ways to make money so I can pay people to help me. But in general, uh, LinkedIn, connect to me there and it'd be fantastic to hear if there's any questions or you know, even call me out on anything that I post and be like, hey, what's this or what's that? And I can answer it on there. That's awesome. I'll, I'll mention your LinkedIn uh, link so that people can reach out to you directly. Uh, yeah. What uh, what's your experience? Like any thoughts on this podcast show? Photoshop podcast. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I listen to different podcasts. I think one, like the, the diary of a C CEO, right? They, they have, here's a question from the last person that you had on, right? Something that, something that engages, it may not even be related, right? And, but, it, but it adds, it adds like that, that air of mystery. I have no idea what answer, what question I'm going to get, right? I mean, I don't know what questions here. We were just kind of going off and just having a conversation. It's not, it's not planned. Like, I don't have any, like, I'm not reading anything. So I do look up from time to time for the thinking. Uh, but in general, so I think, I think that and or uh, finding ways to incorporate other people's answers. Like, hey, you know, this past guest said this. You know, what do you think about that? And it's like, oh, well, especially if I know the person or I know what they've said or I've seen them on LinkedIn or I've seen them around. It's like, oh, well, I, my perspective of perspective of that could be this, right? And but again, it gives you another viewpoint because that that goes back to that teach, right? So ideally, especially doing podcasts, especially doing interviews, you you want to teach. You want to be able to what like the people watching this should say, "I'm going to get something out of this." What am I getting out of it? And that and that first quick two minutes, that first quick like thirty seconds, or that thumbnail is going to be like, "This is what you get." And they go, "Cool, I'm going to click on that and I'm going to listen to it." And here's why. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was a pleasure having you, uh, Doug, on the show. And I really enjoyed. I hopefully audience will also enjoy. Along with that, they will gain some value. So thank you yeah, again. Sounds great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Cool. Well, then we'll, talk to you, we'll talk to you soon. And, and thanks yeah. for reaching out. And um, yeah, have a good day. Sure. You too. Have a good weekend. Uh, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.